Welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining today's webinar, Realizing the ROI in M&A Software Solutions. My name is Mark Herndon. I serve as Chairman of the M&A Leadership Council and I'm honored to be your moderator for today's discussion. Now all along at the M&A Leadership Council, we've strongly believed that uh, properly implemented and used M&A Software Solutions can and should be a very important part of the overall capability set for most acquirers. The business case is there, the use case is there, and yet many acquirers are not fully utilizing these solutions uh, for their own advantage. And so we wanted today to focus on going right to the top experts in the entire industry and focus on uh, meaningful insights and objective advice for executives and organizations that can or should be thinking about adding M&A software solutions as a part of their overall M&A capability set. Joining us today is a highly distinguished panel of true experts in the M&A software solutions and M&A capability development space. And gentlemen, I want to make a personal welcome to you and say thank you, especially for your commitment to the overall M&A community as a whole and to those organizations that are really focused on getting good as acquirers and building in these skill sets and solutions to their internal M&A capability. We know you all. We've worked with you for many years. We know your solutions. We know they work, and we're excited uh, to bring this distinctive panel to the M&A community uh, today. Now, uh, a word to our participants with us today. You will be receiving a copy of today's discussion deck, along with a full copy of the narrative bios and the contact information for each of these individual expert panelists joining us today to uh, provide just a little bit of overview context as to why we wanted each of these individuals to be with us, however, let me just introduce each very briefly, and then we'll jump right into our conversation for today. Starting with Nick Perdiccas, for the last nine years, Nick has served as CEO and Chief Revenue Officer with Devonsoft. Nick has more than 30 years of experience in the information technology industry and has served in multiple senior management roles uh, with companies ranging from startups to very large uh, enterprises. Nick is a graduate of the University of Maryland with a bachelor's degree in computer science. Nick, delighted to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Fantastic. Uh, turning now to Alan Kroll, who is the CEO and chairman of Eno Inc. He is also a 21-year veteran and vice president of Digital Equipment Corporation, where he was instrumental in the internal merger of two service businesses resulting in a multi-billion dollar organization. Other roles outside of digital include serving as president and COO, supporting M&A transactions on both sides of the table to include integrations and divestitures. He earned the Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Drexel and his Master of Science in Engineering from Penn. Alan, honored to have you. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. Turning now to Ari Solonen. For the last seven years, Ari has served as CEO of Medaxo, and he has extensive executive experience in the technology and software sectors with a variety of roles, including general manager, COO, senior VP of sales, senior VP of ops. And he also uh, served formerly as an associate uh, partner with McKinsey and Company, where his roles included supporting M&A and corporate development engagements. He earned the doctorate degree in industrial engineering and finance, and also served as an infantry officer in the Finnish Defense Forces. Ari, honored to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure to be here. John Bender is president of M&A Partners, the exclusive integration partner of the M&A Leadership Council. And John has led over 50 end-to-end uh, M&A -end assignments, all areas of the life cycle of an M&A, with a cumulative enterprise value of over $70 billion and with every major industry sector. John is widely known for his role as Executive Director of Integration with the HP Compact Merger. Uh, John holds a Bachelor's of Mechanical Engineering from Case Western Reserve University and an Executive MBA from Harvard Business School. John, welcome. Thank you, Mark. All right, now a word to panelists. Uh, in our planning session, we agreed that this was going to be a very organic, uh, very um, uh, informative uh, and fun conversation. So we've agreed to balance participation with each of the experts represented on the panel. And we've defined, if you will, a batting order of um, how we'll tee up each particular question to ensure we have time for each uh, participant to weigh in fully. So uh, our first question will be um, uh, led by uh, Nick Perdiccas. And let me just tee that up briefly, Nick. Uh, it's about challenges that M&A purpose-built software solutions can address. And we all know that the ecosystem of M&A software and M&A as a whole is very complex. There's a lot of alternatives out there. 
And yet there's a lot of critical needs that executives are not tapping M&A purpose-built software solutions to provide. What are some of those challenges that organizations should look to software to provide? Yeah, certainly. Um, Chris, I'd like to, to thank the Leadership Council for um, putting together this webinar and um, you know, looking forward to sharing our experiences and uh, insights you know, with the audience. Um, so speaking of challenges, really challenges co can cut across multiple uh, areas of the, of the business of the M&A lifecycle, um, from corp dev all the way through post-merger integration, divestiture, and other kinds of programs. Uh, when we talk to, uh, to customers and, and those who are sort of facing challenges today, the things that tend to kind of gravitate around corp dev are things such as you know, trying to track the pipeline, trying to manage a due diligence process. You know, today we see a lot of uh, spreadsheets and emails and that creates a lot of uh, sort of distribution of data. And it's hard to really keep everything in sync, especially if you have a larger team and you're working across multiple parts of the business. On the uh, post-merger side, the integration um, area, some of the challenges are really trying to build a cohesive work plan and model in order to drive those uh, synergy realizations uh, that are sought after as part of the deal. So having, um, you know, today a lot of the tools that you see out there tend to be disparate technologies, they're, they're, they're standalone. The information, the data is not well organized or at least it's very difficult to get to a single source of truth. So in that case, you know, the, the challenge is really to address that particular pain point. And it's sort of overlapping challenges across both parts of the fa both phases, you know, pre-close and post-close. And those are basically, you know, finding um, a, a better, better way to visualize progress, track issues and risks, bring the team together under a single um, goal and objective and work plan. So everybody's driving towards the same value from the deal in such a way that you can, as leadership team, um, identify your progress and quickly be able to assess if there's any course correction that's needed. And, and you can really only do that if all that information and data is in a single place. Thank you. Alan, your thoughts on that? Well, I really agree with Nick in terms of uh, the data challenge. In fact, I like to describe it as both a data location and a data integrity problem. Uh, the data is all over the place, email, spreadsheets, uh, PowerPoint, shared drives. Very difficult to get a, an understanding of the big picture until somebody pulls that all together in a report for, for executive management. The other, uh, the integrity component of that is when, it, when the data is in those different systems and it comes at the, the M&A team from all angles, it's often an inconsistent form and format. And that makes it even harder to kind of look across all the data and draw any conclusions. So that point about single uh, source of truth is, is so key, Nick. The other challenge, I'll, I'll mention two more. Uh, one is just how long it takes to get to value, time to value. Uh, time, in this case, uh, the longer it takes, typically the worse it is because there's more opportunity for um, data leakage, synergy leakage, and, and quite frankly, uh, loss of employees and customers because in that period when you're going through transition, it can be chaotic unless you're very well organized. So I think uh, it's a huge challenge. And actually kind of to dovetail on that, um, executive management has the challenge of doing this activity at the same time, keeping the business running, achieving the, all the normal objectives and retaining clients and employees. So many challenges. Excellent input. Ari, I'm gonna open it up to you at this point. Sure, so first, uh, thank you for the audience. I think you are thought leaders in um, uh, wanting to learn more uh, and see the applicability for your situation. So uh, tip of my hat uh, to the audience to, to be here today. So uh, from our perspective, I think this one key is to realize that there's a, yes, of course, process improvements, there's a consistency of data, but taking a step back and the fundamental objective is to create value uh, in M&A or any other corporate, corporate development action. Um, Mark uh, mentioned uh, earlier that uh, only a small fraction of the deals do meet their objectives. So it is a frequent problem that needs to be addressed. Um, oftentimes what happens is 
defining the investment thesis uh, or deal thesis, uh, but not then steering uh, the due diligence into proving or disproving the value drivers, if you will, but rather using a standard checklist for due diligence for every deal, or steering the integration to the value drivers and really capturing the value why the M&A is done, um, uh, because of the value and M&A is done, uh, and really focusing on like hygiene factors like combining payrolls. So we at Miraxo really think that the platforms solve this sort of value, value creation challenge, meaning defining the thesis up front, using the platform to make sure you focus on the right things, on the, on the due diligence, proving the value, and then actually going and capturing the value in, in integration. So that would be this sort of a overarching um, uh, strategy for, for driving, um, uh, driving M&A uh, and uh, using platforms to solve those underlying problems. Excellent. John, a few minutes, or a couple of seconds left, uh, maybe 30 seconds. Uh, thoughts on that? And we may have lost uh, John's um, audio and video feed. Uh, April or Noel, if you can help him with that, get back online. So in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead to the next question, which is about results. And um, Alan, you're going to be the lead batter on this question. Let me just provide uh, some context for our participants here today. You know, we're using the phrase ROI really as a broad catch-all phrase, as we often do just in day-to-day, -day, for any meaningful business result outcome, whether qualitative or quantitative, and certainly you know, some of those will be financial. But, you know, from an executive objective advice standpoint, Alan, what should executives really be looking for software to achieve in terms of those business result outcomes? Well, I think that the, the whole purpose of using a power tool is to overcome the challenges that we just talked about a minute ago. And, um, to, and the reason you want to do that is to get to the, the key result, which is delivering that value that's been that that Ari just talked about uh, in full, uh, full value, uh, and you know remember this is in the context of commitments you have made as an executive to your stakeholders. You've got to deliver, and all too often that just doesn't happen. Um, I like to frame it in the context of um, efficiency and effectiveness, and I I, did, I looked up the dictionary definition. Efficiency is the ability to accomplish something with the least amount of wasted time, money, and effort. Effectiveness is the degree to which something is successful in producing a desired result. Power tools, when applied to the M&A challenges, actually increase both. Um, but it, when you look at the, the relative ROI, uh, my assessment is that effectiveness is really going to give you the, the greatest returns. Uh, and, and depending on the size of your deal, that having an effective, well-managed process can actually be result in millions. And that comes in the form of, in some cases, reducing the time to value, achieving the synergies sooner whether they be revenue drivers or cost savings or market expansion or talent acquisition, whatever it is, if you can do it more effectively and consistently, that really provides a big payoff. Um, having a power tool also actually equips you to, in some cases, identify more in the way of value drivers and capture them with some certainty, with a lot of certainty. There, there's really benefits on the efficiency side as well. Um, if your staff can be more productive um, and they can spend their time leading and deciding and analyzing rather than chasing and entering data and trying to get to, and information from all these disparate systems together, that's a huge gain. Now, you know, that's why I make the distinction. Effectiveness can lead to millions in ROI. Greater efficiency can actually also lead to thousands in savings. And I think you'd, I like to put them in, in that perspective. Having a power tool also leads to better collaboration, more effective communication, more effective meetings at all levels. If, you know, I don't know about all of you, but 
I, I came from a world where we would get together in a meeting and the first 15 minutes were spent arguing about who had the, the most recent spreadsheet, most recent version <laughs> of the spreadsheet. Version That's, control you know, is always the bane of any uh, diligence team or integration team. Well put, Alan. And uh, let me let me use that as a segue, if I can, to you, Ari. A uh, very important topic. Uh, what should executives expect in terms of result outcomes? So uh, uh, thank you, Alan, for laying out this sort of a, uh, groundwork and, and the, the topics that where the benefits really accrue from. Uh, let me throw in a couple numbers, and these are publicly shared numbers, so I can I can uh, mention them. Um, and they are all um, you know, customers that we know very well. Daimler, for example, uh, now states that they can review five times more tar targets using, using a platform that, that is focused on supporting that. Hewlett Packard Enterprise has a 50% shorter due diligence time and 50% lower external legal spend in due diligence than they used, used uh, in, in the past. Philips has 40% shorter uh, integration time. Um, in, in fact, Hewlett Packard uh, Enterprise um, in one um, event announced that they have created two, $20 billion of shareholder value through their 80 deals and three splits. Smaller companies obviously have similar kinds of benefits. Um, and obviously, no, none of, not all of these are attributable to a software platform, but they drive process improvement, knowledge accumulation, so they are enabled by a, a software. But if I want to take a step back and say, beyond this sort of process improvement and that data inter integrity. And I think the key for all executives really is to make sure that they can execute their strategy. Um, the strategy may be uh, for, uh, say, uh, a private equity platform company to do, uh, really build an M&A machine and execute, you know, 60 deals in three years to consolidate an industry. Uh, that's a fundamental to, that, to, to, to their success. Or a strategic acquirer might need to be able to improve their speed to be able to compete with private equity firms who are who have built this of an internal m a machine or a multi-business organization needs to shape its portfolio through acquisitions and divestitures and the, the key value that uh, an outcome beyond this of a process improvement is you know, being, being able to actually execute your inorganic strategy ari thank you nick i want to get you in the conversation your thoughts so completely agree with um, both uh, Alan and Ari. This is a has a lot of potential. It can drive a lot of value in the business and in the process of M and A. Um, and I, I'll go back to you know what are executives and leaders really looking for? They're looking for ways to increase their ROI from a deal perspective, reduce risk, and get that value done faster. And I think um, these kinds of solutions provide that avenue, provide that insight, the visibility into what's happening from a collective standpoint, a unified tool that brings all of that information in one single place so they can I, see how they're progressing and take corrective actions if there's a problem and they can identify that. And, you know, we hear from customers all the time, hey, we, you know, we, would, we wouldn't have known about this issue that was going to hit us had it not been for the software seeing that these dependencies and other factors really were starting to get impacted, right? So it obviously, you know, makes us feel really good when we know we can make, uh, you know, have a, have a profound impact on the outcomes. Fantastic, John, welcome back. I wanna draw you into the conversation on results. Give us your thoughts from an implementation standpoint and an integration standpoint. Sure, I, I'd highlight two benefits, control and early warning. And this dovetails really nicely on what our panelists have already said. You know, value erosion can and does occur at every point in the M&A life cycle. And so what executives should really expect from a software investment is better control of the overall process from deal pipeline management to prospect management to confirmatory due diligence to post-merger integration. And you really get that because all the key data associated with that investment thesis is centrally housed, it's centrally accessed, it's reported, and actioned, and even internal and external audit compliance is simplified. So that control is a huge benefit. Second that I would highlight is uh, predictive insights. And an appropriate fit for purpose integration plan, which is line of sight to your deal value drivers can really be supercharged with purpose-built M&A software. Uh, with the right choice of predictive milestones, you can get an early warning system on when uh, uh, certain initiatives are going to go 
into the weeds and that allows you and allows you to react more early uh, to address. So unlike quarterly summaries of financials, which are more back, backward looking or retrospectives, as you see milestones turning yellow and red, you now have a chance to take action and course correct earlier. Panelists, uh, excellent job on that. Uh, really appreciate that. Let's move on to another very important uh, topic, which is selection. And I'll start this out by saying that at the MA Leadership Council, we know that getting the right solution for each particular user or organization is about more than just a feature benefit comparison. So let's click into that. And Ari, you're first up on this one. What's your advice? How do executives really ensure that they're getting the right solution for the right reasons in their organization? Thank you, Mark. Uh, let, let me actually start a bit further uh, uh, in, in the process. And it, it is really to make sure that the uh, you are a candidate to adopt uh, a purpose-built software. And um, in fact, we have told um, quite a few prospects and customers that they should fix their processes and streamline their, and their approach before applying technology or automation to, to that. Um, and you can obviously use um, uh, MNA Leadership Council and other partners to help you figure it out, uh, because it, it really makes sense to start from a, from a you know, um, streamlined slate. Um, and echoing Mark, I think it's beyond this sort of feature comparison. Um, it is a, it's, it's really important to pick a partner. There will be obviously ups and downs in the, in the relationship. These are multi-year relationships. You are executing a, a crucial um, uh, strategic effort on, on the platform. So look at this sort of credibility, experience, size, scope, and strength of your partner, so that the partner will be there, you know, um, in, in in the ups and downs um, of, the, of the of the of the relationship. And there are a couple couple of ways. So I think there are kind of related to the provider. Maybe look at the public track record. Uh, look at the past performance, as it is a some sort of a predictor of future success. Now, there's actually an old Toyota ad that said, ask somebody who drives one. And I think that really um, applies to our domain as well. Look at the websites, look at the G2 reviews, uh, ask somebody who's using it. Uh, because there may be differences that, uh, and uh, there may be a one fitting your purpose is better than the other. The second one is a, uh, this is not, not really software related, but it's a related to the resources and scope and, and your reach to support you to onboard you if your, if your m and takes you abroad, um, to support you in Europe, support you in Europe, um, have the 24-7 uh, support that, need, that you need. So if, if things go awry, uh, that, uh, that you don't, um, you get the, uh, the sort of benefit of, of some, the vendor being there. And um, creating values uh, is nothing if you put your information at risk. So related to the companies, look at, the, look at what, what, what they have done, um, to make sure that your information is safe. Look at the certifications like ISO 27001. Um, look at that they are their own certificates rather than uh, in somebody else's like uh, the hosting providers. In, in fact, somebody said that uh, you know, driving a Volvo doesn't make you a great driver or safe driver if you don't have a driver's license. So make, <laughs> make sure that uh, the, what you're getting is, a, is, a, is, uh, is what you're expecting to get. With the software, I, I think this is a, Key pointers are, is, does it have the functions and features that you need today, but also tomorrow? And one example of this might be uh, that we have found very helpful is an integrated VDR. So rather than using a separate VDR, uh, will, will it have the function, functions and features to, to support that? Very good, uh, Ari. Uh, Nick, I'm gonna turn to you as next batter. Give us your thoughts on selection. Certainly, so uh, um, in doing a, a proper selection and effective selection, you obviously need to know what problem you're trying to address. Some are known and there's always this, you don't know what you don't know, right? And that's where uh, we come into the picture, right? We can help drive some of those discussions. We can help lead along the way. Um, make sure you guys are asking the right questions because having the right questions, you'll get correct, you know, the answers that you really need to understand whether you're looking at it from the right lens and not from a idea that this is a panacea and it's gonna solve all of your challenges. Because as I already said, you need a foundation. You gotta make sure that your house is in good order and good shape before you really start implementing something. Otherwise, you're just gonna accelerate all the problems and you're just gonna surface those issues. Um, important to really have 
a, a definition across your group, like who's really going to be involved in this uh, selection, who's going to be a stakeholder in this process of gathering those requirements. Get your list of must-haves. Um, I can't tell you how often it's it, it's sort of, hey, tell us what you guys can do for us. And it's, it's like, okay, wait a minute, let's first understand what you're trying to solve and let's make sure you're trying to solve the right problems. So doing that is a is a very important part of the process because then it leads into whether or not you're going to have a successful implementation. Because if you go into it, you know, about 50%, um, you're likely not going to be very happy at the end of the this road. Great advice, Alan. Got to get you in on this conversation. Your thoughts, please. Well, I, I'm going to echo everything, but say that you also need to look inside, look at your own company, look at your own culture. What's the appetite for adopting a solution? And pick something that's, you know, obviously a good fit, uh, and but it has to have a high potential for being embraced and adopted. So you can only just decide that based on an understanding of your own environment. And and really, uh, I agree with the point about being able to grow to future requirements, uh, but also understand what are the must-haves versus the nice-to-haves. You can get something with lots of bells and whistles, but if you're not going to use them, it's just you know not really that important in your decision process. Excellent. Um, just a little bit of time left. John, I know you're having some uh, video issues. If you've got uh, audio, um, let us know and you can uh, weigh in appropriately and uh, we'll uh, circle back during the open Q&A portion to make sure we uh, get the full balanced conversation. Watching the clock though, I want to get to this next question because this is really, really key. And for our participants, um, we're going to do this in a round robin format. We provided a couple of minutes for each panelist and we're doing great on time. So gentlemen, I really want to challenge you now on the deployment and implementation topic. Um, you know, the context is we know the software solutions work. We have direct experience uh, deploying and using each of your solutions in the field with clients and live deal situations. And yet, we all know that not every customer is as successful in their particular use of their instance. So we want to drill into what it takes. And as we were doing our discussions, there's clearly a deployment consideration. Where, when, what division? Is it enterprise-wide? Is it everybody in the tool or some selection of those? How do you most effectively roll out the solution? And of course, that all important user adoption um, uh, consideration. So this is a very important topic. Let's take our time and really work through this effectively. Uh, Nick, your um, first batter on this one, take over for us. So yeah, absolutely, you're right. This is one of the most critical phases of um, really getting value out of an M&A solution for your company. Uh, I go back to the selection. It sort of starts with your goals and objectives. What are you trying to achieve, right? What are the results and outcomes that you want from an M&A software solution? Um, how is your company internally organized? And what part of the organization are you looking to um, affect first? And Mark, you mentioned, you know, is it the entire enterprise? Is it maybe just corp dev to begin with, and then later the integration when the deal closes, and now you're going to roll it out to additional to the functional areas? Um, how is change management going to be uh, orchestrated? That's probably the most challenging piece. Uh, we find that if you're dealing with a large organization, you may want to think about a phased approach. Um, get small wins, because if you can get wins under your belt, you can use that to uh, propel into additional adoption across the business. Uh, if you have a large integration project and you're trying to you know, onboard hundreds of people, unless you have you know, a, um, advisors and consultants really working side by side with you who have experience with the technology, if you're trying to do it all you know, at first, you are putting a lot of risk on the table. So uh, communication is critical. Just communicate, communicate, communicate um, to make sure that you're reaching the appropriate people and involve the right stakeholders in the implementation planning process. Uh, so you know we can, uh, you know, as software providers, we can certainly guide you through this process. But again, it's a it's a team sport. Um, it's us with you working along, you know, side by side down this journey uh, to help you really be successful. Excellent. Alan, your thoughts? Again, echoing uh, um, what Nick just said, executive commitment is really key. You've got to have a mandate and consistency. Um, we all know that there's a lot of excitement in doing the deal, 
Um, but getting, keeping the executives involved when you're actually doing the integration after the close is a challenge. And, and it's, it's, I think, an important element in a successful deployment. Another thing I would say is to really be clear on your governing principles and how you're going to make decisions. Uh, and then use the tool to instantiate those processes and practices and make it in everybody's face as a reminder of this is how we decide, this is how we uh, make these governance choices. This is a little bit off the, the, the topic of the tool, but it's I think it's worthy of, of emphasizing. And that is you've got to select strong, capable leaders. Um, we probably have all heard the expression, availability is not a skill. Don't pick somebody to run your integration because they're available. You, uh, managing an integration project is not the same as managing other projects. And, and so having experience, ideally experience using a tool is really important. And to that point, uh, if, you, if you have the luxury, not everybody does, but if you have the luxury to deploy in advance of the need, do so. Because it's a lot harder to change the, uh, the tires on a, on a race car moving down the track than when it's in the pit. So take the time out, take the time to do it right. Excellent point. And um, John, I know you've had some technical difficulties. Uh, you've rejoined by audio. I uh, want to get you involved in the conversation. And, you know, we've got a couple of minutes here. Uh, doing fine on time, everybody. So, John, if you can jump in on the deployment and implementation question with your thoughts, and then if you uh, would like to circle back on the selection issue as well. Sure. So, you know, thanks. I'm going to really just extend from all the wonderful comments we've heard so far on this topic. Uh, our perspective is that purpose-built m a software is really powerful, and each of the packages represented by the panel today is very configurable. It can support an extremely wide range of industries, all working on an array of m a and D deals of various sizes and complexity, spanning from small tech and talent deals to multi-billion dollar global deals spanning dozens of countries. And that flexibility can drive setup and configuration opportunities that can be perceived as complex and challenging, but really aren't. Uh, in our point of view, uh, best practice implementations really start with the company's M&A operating model. What we mean by that is it's just how the company drives M&A from an organization, process systems and data perspective, and, and really bringing that to the table as you embark on the journey of implementing purpose-built M&A software. With that in mind, in that context, you can configure your system accordingly. So as an example, um, many M&A &A and D deals are focused on synergy capture, both on the revenue side and the cost side. In your company, how does that happen? Um, how does your company identify, validate, and track synergy capture? With an understanding of that process, then you can configure your software system to meet those needs. And answering those questions across the plethora of M&A and D topics is really important. Really good, John. Thanks. And this is exactly what we wanted to have happen. Um, let's just go open forum um, on this very important topic. Gentlemen, what else would you emphasize for our audience today? I would actually highlight, in addition to um, uh, uh, Nick's and Alan's uh, well-described uh, approaches, that, that uh, uh, de um, deploying M&A software I isn't really an IT project. It is a change management effort. So IT is uh, maybe on the 10th place uh, in, in, in this. What I would emphasize is this sort of individual level stick and carrot and maybe an enablement, meaning people adopt software when, it, when, they, when their work becomes easier, faster, more rewarding. They can go home for the weekend rather than crafting a charge um, 100 hours a week. They make fewer mistakes. So that's an that's a individual carrot that we need to, need, to, need to have. Second one is this sort of a stick, also at an individual level, meaning um, viewing uh, say a pay, PMO status discussions directly on the platform. If it's not in Medux, so it didn't happen. So there's a bit of a encouragement to um, get it in. And a lot of, lot of tools to enable. There's a, um, a the CEO videos, for example, newsletters, uh, celebrating successes, um, having um, uh, having best practices sharing sessions. So it's a ground level change management effort, and uh, there's no um, no uh, no hiding that effort. Excellent. 
open forum. Anyone else? John, you've kind of gotten the short end of the stick due to technical issues. Um, jump in. Any th other thoughts on what the panel has presented today? You know, I, I really resonate with uh, the change management comments. And, you know, one of the things, one of the key reasons that a company would choose to implement purpose-built m &A software is to really increase organizational bandwidth and capacity. Uh, which is so uh, uh, common of a challenge in today's resource-constrained firms. And so the software really automates the mundane non-value-added work, the, you know, the tracking of issues, the uh, uh, tracking of decisions, status and reporting, all that time is really saved. And that allows the team to manage by exception. This allows the team to really prioritize the right conversations, and meetings and, and focus on the important things. Uh, what are the critical decisions that need to be taken? Uh, what risks need mitigating? What issues cross-functionally need working to really achieve that business case? And to me, that's really the heart of the engagement and adoption conversation. When people realize that they're going to get this kind of tremendous benefit out of the software, they're more likely to adopt it. And so, while uh, many companies are going through tool fatigue, it's yet another tool. Do we really have to, you know, yada, yada, yada. If you can point out all of the tremendous benefits that the software accrues for the organization, you can then build that momentum. And with a nice rollout, which typically starts with one or two functions, or perhaps your DMO or your IMO, and some good support, you can really drive that engagement and adoption. And the tool then really drives that ROI you're looking for. John, thanks. Nick or Alan, open forum. Yeah, I, I would um, also just add that you know you want to right size the implementation for the um, uh, purpose of what you're trying to accomplish. In other words, you know if you're looking to just again serve a smaller group, a corp dev group, maybe you know 10, 15 people, it's going to be very different than if you're trying to roll this out across 300 people, right? And so. Um, you want to make sure that you're not trying to boil the ocean, but also you want to right size the implementation and, and make it uh, practical and realistic. Um, if you have a formal implementation plan, which we would highly recommend, especially for larger implementations, everybody knows what's going to happen, right? It's a project. You need competent people uh, running this internally within your company. It isn't just the vendor that everything falls on, right? We're here to support you. But at the end of the day, you guys got to own the process and you got to know what you're getting into. So you got to understand your level of commitment and the commitment across your team that's needed. And that's really going to help drive that kind of change management um, and that executive leadership, Alan, like you mentioned, you know, that's really, really critical because then you've got some teeth and, and, and you're able to, you know, uh, drive that through the, through the organization. Makes sense. Alan, final comment? Uh, just summarizing, I think it's really key to pace the deployment based on your knowledge of your own organization. Don't necessarily try to do everything at once. Look for that uh, first adopter, early adopter, and, and make them a champion uh, role model, and make sure you've got that executive commitment. Yeah. Excellent job, panelists. Uh, let me give you a, a break. Uh, take a cup of uh, drink of coffee or uh, uh, deeper breath, and I'm going to turn to our participants now that have joined us, and we want to shift to the open Q&A portion of our webinar today. We already have a number of outstanding questions. Uh, we look forward to getting to as many of those as possible. You know the drill by now. Use the uh, questions poll uh, in your GoToWebinar dashboard to the right of your screens. Submit those questions. We will throw those open to the panels. And if we run out of time and don't have a chance to get to each question, we'll be glad to uh, follow up to make sure you have a connection and some additional insight. Uh, while you are populating questions for this outstanding panel, uh, what I want to do is uh, just talk a little bit more about M&A Leadership Council. If this is your first time with us in one of our events, thank you for joining. We are a uh, an educational consortium comprised of professional services firms and practitioners in the art and science of M&A. We're all about what works in the real world, and we do that through research, publications, a range of outstanding training programs, and of course, a certification program called the Certified M&A Specialist. We've been honored to um, uh, work at this for the past 11 years. We've trained over 4,500 executives from over 700 global companies. Um, and the hallmark of the M&A Leadership Council events uh, like this, true expertise, 
um, core practitioners in their respective disciplines focused on what really produces the maximum results from end to end throughout that comprehensive M&A uh, life cycle. We are uh, pleased to have a number of outstanding training programs. So for more information on this, please go to macouncil.org. Uh, we have an outstanding slate of training programs online over the next several months, and please don't forget to use that registration code at the bottom of your screen for a 30% discount on any of these training programs coming up. Just real quickly before we turn to our questions, uh, I wanna make note of uh, March 16th, our next M&A Leadership Council webinar, an event that we'll call Lessons from the Deal Kings, and we're deeply honored to have uh, key leaders from Microsoft, Google, and Cisco Systems uh, join to talk about how they do it at a high volume, ongoing, simultaneous acquisition firm that has really embedded deep skills, processes, and capabilities. So please be sure and mark your calendars and register for that. And with that, uh, gentlemen, we're gonna go to some open questions. Uh, we've got some great ones here. And uh, looks like, um, Alan, this one has first come to you. I'm going to uh, point it your direction, Alan. How do you build the business case to adopt a power tool solution? How do you convince executives and board? Well, it's really the, the subject of this webinar is, is understanding the return on investment. Um, typically, your CEO or CFO are going to need to sign off on it. It's, it's typically done at that level. And um, the common language there is financial return. Um, and we believe that you can actually break the whole process down and begin to quantify it. I think this gets to another one of the questions that was asked. Um, for example, if you can complete the process, if it's gonna be an 18 month process and you can get it done in 17 months, what does that translate to in terms of accelerated value attainment? What does that also translate to in terms of reduced cost of the entire M&A team? And you can look at uh, all the different elements. Another element would be um, risk mitigation. There's always risks. Um, sometimes there's claims that end up with, with litigation. Those are very costly. If you can avoid one litigation, you probably have uh, justified the cost of the solution right there. Um, and there's other dimensions, but I, I'll leave it to my colleagues to uh, add to that. Sounds good. Uh, Ari, I'm just going to pick another one um, off the list, and uh, it's a great one to ask uh, to you. Uh, information security is important in M&A. Um, how would you advise companies um, that are concerned about having their M&A data in the cloud? Thank you for a great question. And I, obviously, value creation is nothing if you, if you lose your information. Um, a few considerations. I, I think if you are if you're selecting a, a, a tool or a platform, uh, conduct a security audit, um, and that that'll give you an insight into what what the what the solution is all, all about, what the company is all about. And I uh, recall we have had 169 um, evaluations by customers, and yet to fail one. But that gives you a, a an understanding of what the company is made of. Second, we actually had a one consulting firm did did a hired a white hat hacking firm to penetrate our platform, uh, and uh, they couldn't. So uh, the consulting firm was happy with the result. But again, you know, do your do your own due diligence. Um, Very good. Ask, ask for material, ask for certifications, do your due diligence. Um, it's not an easy one, but don't make it the main one. It's an, it's an important one, but not the main one. Excellent. And uh, Nick and Alan, very important question. Other thoughts and comments? Uh, I think that well covers it, yeah. All right, um, Nick, here's another question on the queue. Um, it is a common one. I know you're familiar with this type of question, but um, we've just started a new integration and we're having some challenges. We believe a tool would help us in that particular situation. Um, does it make sense to implement a tool now? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. I mean, it, it, it's interesting how often People reach out to us because they're, you know, they're just closing a deal. They're getting ready to start the integration planning, and it really depends on where you are in your process. If you, if you're early enough, 
you have signed, you know, you've announced and you're ready to start building your integration plan, especially, you know, a large public deal will take a while to close anyway. Uh, then, yeah, it makes sense to start, but, you know, go through your selection evaluation process. If you're right in the throes of an integration, uh, it's probably not the best time, especially if it's a complex one, because going back to what both uh, Ari and Alan have said, it's, you know, there's underlying structural issues sometimes, organizational challenges and issues you really need to address. <laughs> And don't think of, you know, software is going to solve all your problems. It's it's just going to magnify them if you don't address the underlying issues. So it kind of depends. And now, and the, and the other thing I would say, the third part of that is, um, if you work with a, a an advisory consulting firm, right, who has experience um, with our tools, um, they can also help kind of get that going sooner than later, right? Because they can bring that expertise to the table and work with your team on the ground to get those up and running. I think that reduces the risk as well. So. Sounds good. Yeah, let's go open forum on this. Uh, Alan and then uh, John, jump in here. Yeah, I think it, it, like Nick said, it really depends upon timing and complexity and actually the duration. Um, we have an experience where one of our clients that came to, came to us six months in to a, a, a massive merger, it was a $20 billion merger. And um, they were in spreadsheet hell for six months and they realized they had a problem and it was worth it to them to get a solution because they knew it was gonna take another 18 to 24 months to complete and they didn't wanna keep doing that in spreadsheets. But like I said earlier, if you have the luxury, position yourself in advance, You know, get the tools in, in place, get your staff comfortable. Uh, it's always ideal if you have that luxury. Well put. John, how about your thoughts? Well, every deal is different in size and complexity. And, you know, kind of leaping on Alan's point here, if you have the luxury, we would advocate uh, for indeed bringing the software on board. Um, even if you are very close to integration stage, um, you can appoint an administrator, uh, a key power user that can help work with the software company and uh, configure the system, align it with your M&A operating strategy and support the users. You can and do have flexibility to have the DMO and or IMO drive the software package on behalf of the enterprise and get a lot of the benefits uh, as opposed to trying to uh, promulgate it through all of the functions. So there's a lot of degrees of freedom here. I would say that uh, work with your software provider, look with, work with an experienced consultancy, um, m and partners, as examples, work with all the firms uh, represented here today. And there are a lot of things that you can sh and should consider, um, even late in the game, if you're surprised with a deal that's happened very rapidly, that may enable you to take up uh, and achieve some of the benefits that the software can provide. Right, absolutely. And um, let's continue down this path. And um, we uh, want to just continue to have open dialogue for each of our panelists here for the next uh, several minutes. And uh, We'll keep working off of our questions pod here. I'm going to go to a question by uh, Ryan E, who says, uh, what are the panelists' thoughts on the threshold for either the number of deals or revenue size that makes sense for a software solution? Who wants to start that one? So I, I could chime in, and um, it is actually not the size uh, that, that matters. Uh, we have customers who are you know, Fortune 5 to a $25 million company and everything in, in, in between. We have companies who do 50 deals a year to one that has one deal in two years. I think it's a matter of um, uh, complexity of the deals. If you are complex, uh, you have geographic spread, if you will, time zones, a lot of people involved. Yes, that really and highlights the importance of, of a platform. But if you do more deals, you, you need, need, need that. Um, it really depends on your strategy, uh, what enables you to meet your, your strategic objectives rather than looking at, you know, what others are, others are doing. And I would encourage, think about uh, the alternative, not, not using a platform. Uh, how, how much, how much uh, difficulty would you encounter in, in that case? Very good. Open comments, other views? All right, uh, let me go to the uh, questions pod again. And uh, Matt has asked an excellent question. The panel mentioned that internal their understanding that um, integration processes are key. However, many times external partners may be brought in to help guide the integration. How do the software solutions help bridge the integration gap without external partners who sometimes have their own solution? 
I have an example here, um, and obviously in larger integrations, there oftentimes is a partner, uh, and the partner brings uh, their own methodology and, and uh, perhaps tools as well. Um, one example of how a platform can help is you identify issues to be fixed um, later in the in the process. Say in, in due diligence, you identify that there's an environmental issue in the Minnesota plant. Now that may affect the deal terms or or, or you know price you pay, but ultimately that issue will be fixed in integration maybe seven months later. And uh, so connecting these disparate pieces of the, of, the, of the process is superbly important and is easily done with a, with a platform like, like any one of ours. Open forum, other Mark, thoughts? What, Mark, what I would add to this is that, um, you know, the external partners can really support an organization to understand what good looks right and bring perspective from working on dozens, if not hundreds of deals. and the software clearly is not going to do that. I think from our perspective, the software really de-risks your execution. Uh, it de-risks your organization uh, from missing uh, milestones that are, are drifting from uh, green to yellow to red, uh, perhaps not driving decision-making as quickly or, or as robustly as you could. These are the, the efficiency gains that we see. Uh, I think if you have an inexperienced organization, though, um, it's really important to note that uh, the, the, the software typically is not going to substitute for that third party expertise. And, and the only other thing I would add is that, you know, oftentimes we hear the question of, you know, do, does your software come with any best practices, playbooks, methodologies, you know, processes and work plans. And, and a lot of our tools, I think, do. And I think they look at that as a kind of a starting point, right, to compare against what they're doing and is there anything they're missing and supplement. And again, every deal is different and every integration is going to have unique characteristics that you need to adapt those things. But if that's part of the question, and then yes, there are, you know, our software and our companies all have experience in the space and can help guide at least the, the, the initial kind of launch pad into the integration planning. Excellent. Can yeah, I well, go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, if you have a tool, that you've used to organize your process and you bring a consultant in, everything is already more organized than if, if, it's, if it's spread between spreadsheets, email, PowerPoint, shared drives. They can quickly grasp what's going on. And if they're a truly uh, vendor neutral type of consulting firm, they'll embrace whatever you're using. The flip side of that is also true. And I think all three of us have consulting partners that are very well uh, skilled in using our tools. Uh, and I'll put in a plug for, for your, your organization, Mark, actually M&A Partners, uh, John's organization. Um, you know, I think you guys have demonstrated your ability to go between any of the, the, the major tools and, and function effectively as a consultant. So you're truly vendor neutral. Thank you for that. And John, you may want to weigh in. And I would just add from an M&A Leadership Council standpoint, our conviction is if you're going to be an acquirer, corporate, PE, it doesn't matter. You need to build internal capability and software solutions uh, would be one of seven or eight critical components to really do it right. And that's really the mission of the M&A Leadership Council. So within that construct, it's, it's fantastic. I'm going to uh, jump to another question, gentlemen, if I can. And a uh, common question I'm sure you hear a lot, but um, great ROI benefits, great discussion, um, but what are the most common reasons for resisting to implement a solution? Open forum, who wants to start? <clears throat> yeah, I'll take the first stab at that. Um, I think it's, it's status quo, right? It's, um, you know, I know what I have, I know how it works. Uh, why should I change? Right, and I'm happy with what I've got. The the problem with that is we wouldn't have cell phones today if everybody felt that way. So you got to be thinking, you know, long long vision. You can't just look at it and say, you know, if I just stick with what I have, honestly, it it creates a built-in obsolescence um, and it hurts the business in the long run. Um, I just, you know, I think it, you got to be direct with this, and and that's something that you know, change management and leadership really has to be influenced within the company. You know, if I can jump on this next, the status quo was the top of my list, Nick, so we're in agreement. 
But we also sometimes see, and this is, I think, probably true for a lot of companies, the M&A folks tend to be over, overworked and understaffed. They're too busy to take the time to go slow, to go fast, if that makes any sense. Another thing we often hear is that, you know, I'm chopping wood. I don't have time to, to slow down to sharpen my ax. I got to get that, those logs split or whatever. Uh, so busyness stands in the way of the solution that would actually reduce the busyness. There's also a point on um, that the risks and opportunities in M&A are enormous. So even small improvements can make a difference in, in winning or losing and uh, creating a great career versus a mediocre career. So uh, this way, uh, making, making sure the incentives and the objectives are clear and that typically overcomes the, the hump of, of adoption uh, and, and change. Well I would add, uh, often there's a uh, resistance to, to just the spend. You know, we've got concerned about the budget. And I would say, you know, talk to Nick, talk to Ari, talk to Alan, talk to, give the M&A partners a call. We'll help you build that business case that justifies the software. Um, it isn't always about quantifying risk avoidance, but it's, also, it's often about showing the benefits uh, that results uh, from the efficiencies gained to your program managers, to your IMO lead and his or her staff into the DMO. And so um, that often can uh, be a tipping point in a conversation with a CFO or other business owner that uh, is just resisting opening up the checkbook for one reason or another. Panel, so, this has I'll been say, fantastic. What, yeah, what, 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 wait, real, wait, and then we'll move on. Yeah, yeah, be real quick. Um, you know, I, in terms of those that are typically resistant, uh, my advice is get them involved early in the selection, in the implementation planning, find out who those are, because you know typically who they are in your organization. And what we have seen, our experience, is those same doubters and the ones that push back become the most ardent advocates once they start using the software and they find, oh my gosh, you know, how could I ever go back to the old ways? So that'd be my recommendation. Well put. Gentlemen, this has been fun, and we have covered a lot of the questions. There's a few left. Here's what I want to ask you to do. Um, let's frame some key takeaways for our participants and really get into uh, what do we think is a very important um, final comment or two, given everything that we've talked about and everything that uh, we've uh, addressed in the question pod, or perhaps one thing that's um, not been tabled yet. Final comments, and for this, um, Ari, going back to our first initial batting order, you are next up in the sequence. Okay, so I think, um, um, thank you for considering a, an important step in your strategy execution. Uh, I think you, that, that is the first step is always the most important. And thank you for hearing our perspectives. I think the key consideration is, is whether proceeding is not really an option. Um, there will be more M&A and corporate development going forward. Uh, it, it really is a eat to be or to be eaten type type world. So consider it now. Uh, obviously, the best time to start was three years ago, but there's no time like like today to start uh, thinking about um, how you can en enable your strategy execution going forward. And take a partner for that journey. There will be ups and downs. There will be challenges and and issues. Pick pick the partner uh, that will work with you uh, all the way through. So. Excellent. Uh, Nick, your comments. Sure. So I think um, one of my one of my suggestions, and this kind of ties in with what Ari had said earlier, which is, you know, he used the analogy of, you know, if you want to know what it's like to drive, you know, if you're looking at a Toyota, go get in a Toyota and test drive it, right? If you're looking at, well, go get it in the car and drive it. Um, test out these solutions, right? Look at them and decide, you know, which ones kind of fit your business and the way you like to do things. Then also talk to people in your industry, right? You probably know people in other companies that are using one of our products or they're looking at using or they have used, you know, ask them about what they've learned. Uh, what did they do? What were the things that they would recommend, you know, you sort of add to your uh, evaluation um, and include and involve your team members, especially these key stakeholders those that not only the ones that are going to be early adopters, right, that are tend to be change agents within the organization, but also those that are doubters, because you want a broad representation, because if you get them on board, you're much more likely to get the adoption and the value out of the solution. And last point, look at this as a value-based 
decision. All right, I, I can't tell you how many times I hear, oh, you know, we're sensitive on the cost and, you know, we're off here, we're off there, we need this, you know, can you discount here? And they're missing the big picture, which is, yes, you know, everybody can, you know, do something there to play with the numbers, but you got to look at the total ROI. You know, Alan mentioned, if you can get your deal done in, you know, 17 months instead of 18, or you can de-risk parts of your integration, what's that really worth to you? Right, you got to put right. some numbers around that. So, so that's, that's my right. thought. My, my point is, you know, look at the big picture, look at it holistically, um, and you know, focus on the value that you're going to get. Thank you, Nick. Alan, you're up. Well, I think for me, a takeaway is that uh, M&A is one of the highest risk and potentially the highest reward initiatives that any of our companies can undertake. And it's a decision. You actually make a decision. Uh, you can either continue to use non-integrated, what I'll call hand tools. They're actually good productivity tools in their own right, but they're not integrated. And they and this is also a point of resistance. They tend to be readily available and therefore perceived as free. But the cost of doing that is uh, typically your M&A team has to live in spreadsheet hell, if you'll forgive that expression. Uh, you know, if you make that choice, you really have to live with the the risks and the challenges that we listed at the top of this discussion. Or you can use a and decide to use a a purpose built power tool that will reduce the time to value, uh, reduce the risks in a way that is highly repeatable and proven to lead to better outcomes. Thank you, Alan. Uh, John, capstone comments. So I often ask uh, our clients, how often does your company write an eight, nine, or 10 figure check for a major deal? It's a significant endeavor and undertaking. And when you're in a posture like that, it makes sense to get the best tools. And uh, we're talking with the CEOs of, of three of the best out there. So stack the deck in your favor would be my first uh, takeaway. Secondly, treat the selection process like any enterprise software selection process. Be, be requirements driven. Once you get through that phase, uh, third, ensure your internal processes are in place and effective. Um, we've, we've heard Nick, uh, Ari, and Alan all refer to that. Make sure your governance, your lifecycle framework, your resourcing and budgeting processes are all in place. There's some very easy things you can do to true all of that up and get it aligned with the software that ultimately you select. And then um, lastly, create an environment for engagement and adoption. Um, provide support for your stakeholders and your users. Uh, appoint an administrator, get the system configured properly so that it really drives the efficiencies and the benefits that you expect. John, Alan, Nick, Ari, this has been fantastic. And uh, to each of our uh, participants today, um, our sincere apologies. We're a couple of minutes over time, but I could not let that end without getting into some of the additional questions. So I'm glad we spent the time. Gentlemen, please come back to future events with the M&A Leadership Council. Uh, you are all top experts in the M&A software solutions and capability development space. And on behalf of all of us at uh, the M&A Leadership Council, all of our partner organizations and trainees, our sincere thanks to each of you and uh, best of luck. To our participants, um, stay well, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again soon on another M&A Leadership Council online event. Take care, everybody. Thanks again. Thank you all. Thank Take you. care. Thanks, Thank Mark. you, Mark. Thanks, everyone.